All right, all right. What's up, people? What's up, my brother Tank? What's going on, my brother Reggie? Oh, man, not the man ready to get into the this, this sixth chapter of this book, man. We flying uh, through. Flying another through. Day, another day, another chapter. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I said another day, another chapter. <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and start our chapter number six. And that's going to start off with white bridges to wealth and power. The strength of the powerless is its knowledge of the powerful. Since the beginning of time, Africa has been generally recognized as the richest continent on earth. It was blessed with both God and nature with the with a richness of soil, natural resources, and human spirit. Biblical and uh, secular records proclaim Africa as the birthplace of all mankind. As, as admonished, mankind was fruitful and multiplied, leaving Af Africa with additional historical and cultural richness. With so much richness and heritage, one must wonder why Africa remained the most poorly developed country on earth and why generations of blacks around the world are so totally impoverished and powerless. If blacks are to change their marginal conditions, they must know the secrets to other racial and ethnic groups, wealth and power. Blacks need to know what devices Europeans use to acquire and establish control of wealth, especially since just a few centuries ago, Europe was an impoverished continent. Moreover, if blacks are to achieve self-empowerment, they must be able to see the parallel between Europe and the United States. They must know not only the socioeconomic development of Europe, but also what specific factors shifted or stifled the development of Africa. Modern day black impoverishment and powerlessness began, ne oh, began neither in urban ghettos nor rural cotton fields of America, nor were they elements of West African culture, these racial conditions began in the interior of West Africa and can be directly linked to the geopolitical practice of European whites and Arabs centuries ago. Historical records kill, clearly evidence that European wealth was extracted from Africa and the Americas using black labor as a primary instrument. It will be difficult, if not impossible, to precisely pinpoint when European whites began to exploit Africa and blacks because it appears to have started by chance, then escalated into international practice founded on a racial ideology and broad sense of white community, of a white community. Religious, ethnic, and national differences within the broad Caucasian family became subordinate to the collective economic exploitations of blacks during the Middle Ages. The economic exploits of Africa and blacks began in the minds of Europeans and Arabs who placed greed and profits above human value of life, above the value of human life. Their collective greed and machinists Machinism, uh, machinism, oh, sorry about that. Machination have left blacks and legacy of suffering and the black holocaust that has yet to end. Next section the beginning of the great wealth displacement. If a marked displacement, if a marked displacement of Africa's wealth and European treasures is an indicator, then it can be speculated that the major extractive period began during the 14th and 15th centuries. During this time, the entire European continent was riddled with poverty, famine, feudism, and disease. The entire continent was in an economic depression, especially Western Europe. Europe's economy was also weakened by the steady loss of precious metals to Asian nations who would except only gold and payment for trade purchases. While Europe was enduring stagnation, socioeconomic depression, 
West Africa was known for its flourishing empire, major regions, major regional trading centers, and for producing some of the world's finest artifacts. Nations throughout the Mediterranean area were drawn to these West African trading centers by rumor of massive wealth. Three large empires, Ghana, Mali, and Sangye, Sangye drew Europeans, Moors, and Arab traders into West Africa's great trading cities, such as Giao and Timbuktu. Arab and Moorish traders routinely sought West Africa cash crops and natural resources, especially gold, silver, ivory, and salt. Arab tra traders' interest in West Africa was more than routine trade. Their aggressiveness reflected the interest in controlling and profiting from wet wealth of West Africa. Though they controlled most African seaports, especially along the length of the Red Sea, Arabs felt threatened by inland black unity and empire building. The Arabs sought greater access to African wealth through intermarriage, uh, concubinage, trade, and religious, uh, what is that, pro, uh, what is, woo, pro Stalin's T, uh, I'm jacking that all up. Missions of advocating one religious brotherhood. The Arab fab the Arabs fabricated a trading language, uh, Swahili, a uh, a facilitate trade to facilitate trade. Sorry about that. To facilitate trade. Often they exerted religious pressures and continually foster holy wars that weakened the great West African empires. Arabs label Africans pagans, then pressure them to disavow their own West African culture and practice of ancestor worship and to accept instead Ab Arabic culture based on Islamic religion. This cultural and religious conversion undermined Black uh, African heritage and brought sense of Black community. Moreover, religious versions to the Islamic faith gave Arabs nearly unrestricted access, access to West African societies and wealth. The next section. Religion and color unite racial exploiters. The removing of wealth from Africa was not completely confined to Arab and Moorish traders. They were later joined by traders from Portugal, and Spain, who established trading ports around the coast of West Africa, an area commonly known as the Ivory Coast. These groups built their trade around their naval strength and rarely traveled to inland markets. In the year 1441, the first Africans were kidnapped and taken to Lisbon, Portugal, for the specific purpose of enslavement. Contrary to many reports, the first Africans kidnapped and taken to Portugal were not West African Blacks. They were Berbers, an Arabic-speaking, light-skinned people who practiced the Muslim religion and belonged to the Caucasoid race. The Portuguese returned the Berbers to their desert homes after they had extensively questioned them about Black West Africa's alleged wealth. This incident probably re represented the first steps in developing a plan to capture and trade slaves and to establish slavery as an international business rather than a trading custom. Since color was the, device, the decisive factor in slavery, it was important to know who was at, who, who was and was not a member of the black race. Moors were not classified as members of the black race. In Northwest Africa, the offspring of Blacks with white Berbers and Arabs became known as Moors. They lived along the Mediterranean Sea, north of the Sahara Desert. Few identified with West African Blacks who lived south of the Sahara. However, the few Moors who were Black with the aid of some Islamic converts pushed the doors to West Africa's natural and human capital wide open. The Arab and Moor merchants were the few traders who could safely venture into the interior trading markets. Most traders dared not leave 
the coastal port city. Norman Coombs and his book, The Black Enterprise, I'm sorry, Norman Coombs and his book, The Black Experience, expressed the belief that though many Mediterranean and European nations were more advanced than West Africa in military weaponry, science, and technology, the formidableness of Africa's interior and the reputed fighting skill of the Black warriors dissuaded the more militaristic uh, nations from attempting to take West Africa's wealth by force. Instead, they chose to gain access through trade activities. By the late 16th century, West Africa had lost its reputation of invincibility. Her great empires had been weakened by divisive internal forces, which diminished the sense of West African nationhood and togetherness and left its natural and human capital resources unprotected. Tragically, West African leaders failed to take protective measures to guard their natural and human resources from the wealth-seeking self-interest of foreign traders. Man, I wish you would have read this part of the chapter uh, yesterday when we had that conversation with Odu. <laughs> uh, <coughs> next section. Um, hold on real quick. Uh, next section. Black on Black Enslavement. Black West African sense of community was narrowly and, and divisively based on tribal origins rather than on the com commonality of black skin color and collective racial destiny. Tribal and extended family com commitments rarely extended beyond the village compound. West African societies that practiced tribalism had a narrow group identity, much, rac much racial detachment and intergroup animosities. The practice of black on black enslavement made them vulnerable to united ethnocentric groups who were seeking wealth and power at any cost. Weakened from within, West Africa had little basis for developing a broad community cable, capable of uniting against a common enemy. This tribalism provided the wedge that Arab traders eventually used to divide and conquer nearly every tribe in West and Central Africa. African tribal chiefs ignored the greediness of foreign traders who sought increased access to African wealth. Divided and preoccupied with old tribal differences, many West African societies saw little wrong in enslaving and selling blacks from other tribes into slavery. Having escaped Portuguese slavery based upon their lighter skin color, the Berbers joined the Arabs and became the first Martin people to create a continuing commercial demand for a large number of black slaves. Historian, uh, historian David Brian Davis indicated in his book, Slavery and Human Progress, that Arabs enslaved and exploited in the Middle East at least one million black slaves every 100 years from 800 AD to modern times. This practice continues at unknown levels today. The rationale for black on black enslavement. West African tribal chiefs had long history of exchanging slaves with Arab traders. Eventually they expanded the practice to European traders and important trading customs of the tribal chiefs was to insist that all foreign traders purchase some of the uh, chief's personal slaves in order to, deter to order to demonstrate an act of God, faith, and, and bargaining. Other historians such as Norman Combs, August Muir, and Elliot Rudwick uh, posted that tribal chiefs could have included this slave purchasing ritual in their trading practice for the purpose of impressing Arab and more traders with their toughness as well as their absolute control over their subjects and resources. And this, and this, in fact, if this is in fact was their motive, 
then they succeeded. The Arab and European traders began became convinced that if tribal chiefs could procure slaves, the trade would be profitable and they had no reason to expect reprisal from any black nation. A massive slave trading operation developed and according to an article in the Washington Post, the Arabs were engaged in slave trading of blacks in 1993. Let me get up this one post here. All right. The equal, the doctrine of unequal exchange. While Africa human capital was being displaced through slavery, so too were its natural and mineral wealth. Arab, more Spain, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese merchants traded low value fabric, uh, fabricated items such as pig iron, brass rings, religious artifacts, household gadgets, and used firearms for, Af for Africa's highly valued commodity such as gold, silver, quality leather, long cotton, art objects, black slaves, and ivory. Europeans manufactured items were primarily for decorative purposes or tribal warfare. African commodities, on the other hand, were internationally used to undergrid, to undergrid major economies and currencies. This imbalance described by Thomas Sowell, a black economist as the doctrine of unequal exchange allowed natural mineral re, uh, mineral wealth to be transferred from Africa in a steady flow. Massive displacement of Africa's human capital and natural resources weakened West Africa's social and economic institutions. The doctrine of unequal exchange depleted Africa's resources, but the wealth and revenue generated from commerce with, African, uh, with Africa's revived Europe's uh, sagging economies with surplus funds in their treasuries, Europe's nations strengthen their military and commerce communities. By the 17th century, Europe's nations had formed a competitive sense of social togetherness within Europe's within European family. In addition, they shared a common desire to possess more, if not all, of Africa's wealth. As a result, Europeans established trading routes and outposts along the coast of West, West and South Africa. Foreign traders boldly ventured into the interior in search of natural resources and human black gold, exploiting tribalism to divide and conquer. Traders supply the chiefs with weaponry and other compensation for killing and enslaving other Africans. The trader succeeded in gaining control of much of the African continent. Self-destructive attitudes of the tribal chiefs has yet to be fully explained or understood. But historian Norman Combs offered one explanation as to why the chiefs so willingly traded their valuable resources to European and Arab traders. According to Combs, African tribal chiefs willingly participated in such questionable trade practices because West African economies were subsistence based and therefore people were satisfied with the status quo and saw no accumulative wealth and power. Trust or not, true or not, white traders took advantage of the tribal chief generosities this self-destructive tribalism, self-enslavement, and lack of concern for wealth were interpreted by Europeans as a sign of inferiority. They believed these uncivilized childlike heathens neither appreciated nor deserved their God-given wealth. Consequently, whites rationalized that it was their moral duty to take and utilize Africa's wealth and put blacks and productive work as slaves. By the latter part of the 15th century, West Africa's great trading markets had been closed down by Arab invaders and its great university centers were under the control of Arab scholars. The interference 
of Arabs and Europeans into government, educational and religious affairs of West Africa caused the economic conditions of Africa and Europe to reverse. Africa grew poor while Europe grew richer and more powerful. The next section, Europe from weakness to strength. It was no mere coincidence that in the latter part of the 15th century, Europe began recovering from centuries of poverty while Africa was increasingly exploited of its uh, mineral wealth and human capital. As millions of Africans were being kidnapped and sold into slavery around the world, slavery became a simple mechanism by which the wealth of Africa and Blacks could be transferred to Europe. Displacement of African wealth was so massive during the 1500s and 1600s that socioeconomic and political upheavals result, uh, resulted. Northwestern European nations won the competition against Southern European nations to determine which would become the major slave trading region. Southern European banks were the first to feel the effects of the influx of new European wealth. Banking and commerce activity in Western Europe caused a lending and investing revolution that resulted in the relocation of the international banking center from the Mediterranean area to Western Europe. The old mercantile economic principles eventually evolved into the basic uh, economic principles of modern capitalism and political doctrines. With their newly acquired wealth, the major goal of European nations was to accumulate large numbers or large amounts of gold and other precious metals. Most European nations needed to replenish their depleted gold reserves. Further, Europeans wanted access to raw materials, especially gold and silver, because of their unusual value and rarity. The amount of gold and silver owned by developing European nations was a measure of their newfound prosperity. The new mercantile merchants fostered and promoted a new capitalistic principle in order for one person to gain wealth, another must lose wealth. Slavery represented a viable means by which one might be enriched at the expense of others. Western Europeans entered slave trading in the 16th century and applied the new capitalistic principles to old trading practices. Achieving maximum return on investments became the rule. Under Roman laws, slaves had certain rights. But under English laws, slaves were treated as property with no rights. Black slaves were reduced to a level of chattel, equal to property or any other tool. To achieve maximum return on their investments, Black slaves were to be worked to death during their prime years in order to recapture the investment as early as possible, because old Black slaves had no value. In the year 1664, an English Puritan reportedly called slave trading the worst kind of thievery in the world. Next section, Africa, drained of resources and human capital. Through the centuries, Europeans espoused ethnocentric doctrines that encouraged a total of complete exploitation of Africa's natural resources and human capital. By the late 1800s, Massive and concerted exploitation had taken its toll. The wealth power gap between European nations and African nations had widened so much that European nations were no longer fearful of Africa and felt that they could invade and exploit her at will. In the year 1885, European nations met at a conference in Berlin 
and without notifying any African nations, drew lines on a map to divide the African continent amongst themselves. Shortly thereafter, European nations established colonies throughout Africa. They colonized 90% of the African continent and controlled nearly 100% of its wealth. Only Liberia, an American colony, and Ethiopia were uncolonized at that time. In the mid-1960s, some Black African nations were restored to independence, but not because white European nations had developed a moral conscience or no longer needed to exploit Africa and its people. Instead, European nations freed the African nations because they had acquired most of their wealth and power and now felt that they could control those nations just as effectively from the outside. Columbus searches for gold, finds slaves. Natural resources wealth, oh, natural resource wealth that Europeans acquired from Africa withered their appetite for, for the finer things of life. Most European nations wanted gold and silver because these metals were needed for coins, but moreover, they represented the new mark of wealth. These precious metals were more useful than land because they could buy anything anywhere. Thoughts of gold, jewels, and spices from foreign lands stimulated investment and trade as merchants and gentry classes pressed their governments to secure new markets. Competing monarchies in Spain, France, Portugal, and England were willing to gamble lives and newfound wealth on finding more precious metals and spices in the world. Adventurers such as Christopher Columbus accepted the challenge from his financial backers and made several fortunes hunting trips to the New World. On his second trip, Columbus promised the Spanish crown that in return for financial help, he would bring them as much gold as they needed. As and as many slaves as the axe. 17 ships and, 100, and hundreds of men were provided for a second voyage to the New World. To further encourage his success, the Crown promised Columbus 10% of the profit, a governorship over any new land and fame. Columbus and his military contingency arrived in the Caribbean Islands and made inquiries about the location of gold. After only a few pieces of gold were found, Columbus expanded his search to all of the islands, traveling as far as Haiti. He used his military advantage to constrict the peaceful, unarmed Arwak Indians into his massive gold search. As the search became futile, angry Europeans took out their frustration on the defenseless Indians. Many were killed and mutilated. Other arc works were driven to commit suicide. Within two years, nearly half of the 250,000 Indians of Haiti were dead. By the year 1515, there were 50,000 Arwark Indians. By 1550, only 500 remained. Howard Zinn said that a report in 16. 50 show that none of the original amount of gold Columbus attempted to at least keep his promise to the crown regarding slaves. He selected 500 of the strongest male and female Indians and shipped them back to Europe for servitude. But nearly all of them died en route or shortly thereafter due to climate and temperature differences between their Caribbean homeland and European continent. Now, like the exclusive Baham Bahamian gold, an entire race of Aqua Indians does not exist. The Americas became an extension of Africa. Following Columbus' exploration to the New World, a sense of 
competitively explored South and Central America and the Caribbean islands in search of gold and other precious metals. When they, when these resources were discovered, small contingencies of European white coloni colonized the areas in hope of producing wealth and their in the name of their motherland. But European whites were allegedly physically incapable of doing the laborious work and the Indians had been killed off. As a result, black slaves became the chosen tool for producing wealth in the Caribbean and throughout the Americas. Black slaves were needed in the plantation fields of the Caribbean, the tobacco fields of the, P of the Piedmont and the mines of South America. It was the massive influx and dominance of black slaves in mining in agricultural productions that directly linked black enslavement to Europe's increased wealth, power, and industrialization. Organized religion joined hands with government in the race to capture wealth in the new worlds. They merged searching for lost souls and lost gold in the early 1500s. High officials in the Catholic Church designated African Blacks as a primary instrument of mining wealth for white in South and Central America. Because the Indians were killed off by the rigorous labor and European disease, diseases, Blacks were perceived as being physically more durable and expendable. Portuguese and Spanish slave traders moved into high gear buying, selling, and shelling black slaves across the Atlantic Ocean. More than 90% of Africa's kidnapped blacks were shipped to South America and the Caribbean islands. Between 1600 and 1800, black slaves outnumbered the white Europeans entering the Americas. Up until 1820, blacks outnumbered European transported across the Atlantic by a ratio of three to one. Most were settlers in Brazil, given its largest black population outside of the African continent. These black slaves and their descendants were, Brazilian, were Brazil's dominant population until the great mass of European white immigrants arrived in the 1880s. Long after slavery had been terminated, and European wealth and power had been amassed. These new white immigrants arrived to reap the fruits created by forced black labor. A century later, the descendants of Brazil's black slaves are still excluded from enjoying the fruits and are so impoverished that death squad members, that death squads murders the herd, the hordes of black street children who scavenge for food. The next section. Wealth production in the Americas. Portuguese and Spanish colonization of the Americas represented the first systematic and concerted practice by European nations to use African Blacks as the main instrument for accruing wealth. From the 1500s to the 1880s, their long distant trade policies and practices were based on profits from Africa and her dark peoples. The high profits caused Black enslavement to be known as the quote, golden harvest. The economies of South and Central America and the Caribbean islands were based on products made by Africans. Black labor spawned numerous cottage industries that provided Europe with a constant flow of sugar, tobacco, molasses, vinegar, rum, and precious metals. These products significantly changed Europeans' consumer appetites and demands. Black slaves produced a phenomenal amount of wealth for slave traders, settlers, and European nations. In the South American and West Indian markets, slaves drew an average sale price of $500 in the 17th to 18th centuries. When this figure is multiplied by the 10 to 15 million Blacks, slaves that, his, uh, that historian Howard Zinn estimated were transported to the Americas, their revenue from one time only slaves would amount to more than a trillion dollars 
in today's currency. African slaves were typically sold at least twice before reaching their final destination. As a matter of practice, most of the black slaves brought into the Caribbean markets typically were, quote, seasoned, then resold into slave markets in South, Central, and North America at much higher prices and profits. By the 16th century, European powers sought mineral wealth in Africa and Latin America using what they perceived to be the best possible mining equipment, black slave labor. Mines in Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil initially used local Indian labor, but these groups proved to be especially successful when confronted by various European diseases, hard work, and rigorous discipline. A royal ordinance in the year 1503 officially sanctioned introducing black slaves into the Spanish colonies to replace the Indians. Between the year 1501 to 1700, nearly 4 million black slaves were exported to Latin America and the profits of their labor filled various European treasuries. By the year 1660, slaves in Latin American mines had exported 536 million uh, ducats to Spanish treasuries. At today's value, these gold and silver ducats would be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Near the end of the 17th century, Europe's holdings of gold had increased by 20% and its total stock of silver tripled. France had also amassed an abundance of new precious metals from Brazilian mines. The wealth power produced by black slave trading in the Americas intensified competition between European nations. Spain became one of the world's wealthiest and most powerful nations when it pushed Portugal out of the slave trade and mining in Latin America. Between the year 1550 and, 16, and 1600, the amount of silver shipped into Spanish treasuries quadrupled. Kings Philip III and IV used the revenues to military pr protect and acquire more slaves. Much of, much of Spain's new wealth was passed on to neighboring nations in order to repay Italian and German merchants who had financed many of Spain's trade wars in the Americas. Although Spanish, Portuguese, and other European nations disagreed over who should possess wealth produced by slaves in the Americas, there was little, if any, disagreement over which racial group would be the labor force used to produce the wealth. The next section. Europe developed a broad sense of community. England established North America as a colony populated by white-skinned people, preferably of English ethnicity. The English, proud and a puffy people, enjoyed boasting of their heritage and bloodlines. King James, the ruling monarch, had offered to share the wealth of the new colonies with all who sought to settle and be loyal to the English crown. But the new world wealth was to be kept within the English ethnic family first and the broader European family second. A doctrine of racial and ethnic exclusivity simplified the process of establishing a broad sense of community in the strange new world. As the sense of community took root, a foundation was laid for European whites to survive and prosper through expro uh, expro expropriated Indian land and black labor. European whites' fear of the larger number of black slaves intensified their desire to maintain a broad sense of a white community. But in their efforts to maintain a white numerical dominance, they abandoned being an English-only country and recruited 
other white European eth ethnics. The inclusion of other ethnics did not conflict with the original doctrine of exclusivity. Rather than a nation of Englishmen only, America's mandate was broadened to a nation for quote unquote, whites only. The three primary sources of white wealth were inherited wealth, land ownership, and expropriated black labor. The first major bequest of white wealth was passed across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to the white settlers during the colonial period. This wealth from the English crown promoted colonial settlements. British royalty made direct awards of large land grants to royal favorites, territorial governors, and land companies. Royal land grants often encompassed millions of acres. King James issued the first license to establish colonies in North America to the London and Plymouth trading companies, a group of merchant capitalists who sought to improve foreign trade and increase the country's stock of gold. These charter companies organized immigrant groups who were interested in seeking wealth in America. They financially sponsored the first white settlers who could not otherwise afford to come to America and were typically impoverished vagrants, criminals, and adventurers. English immigrants were generally directed by government licensed trade companies to quote, search for all manner of mines of gold, silver, and copper, end quote, in America. The London Company established its first colony of white settlers in Jamestown, Virginia in the year 1607. And contrary to popular myth, few early European settlers immigrated to America for the primary purpose of seeking religious or political freedoms. Most came to the New World for the same reason that most immigrants come to America, for economic opportunities. The London Trade Company promised the immigrants monetary dividends from any gold or precious metals they found. But like their predecessors, Columbus, they found no gold. Fewer than half survived the first year. Of 6,000 new settlers who arrived between the year 1620 and the year 1622, two thirds were dead before the year 1625. Friendly Indians rescued the remainder and taught them how to survive in the harsh wilderness. European settlers repaid the Indians' kindness by establishing trade relations based on the doctrine of unequal exchange. As discussed earlier, this exploitative, exploitative trading practice had been successfully used by European traders on tribal chiefs in West Africa. And like Africans, the Indians traded valuable items such as furs, gold, land, tobacco, and food for less valuable items such as Bibles, blankets, trinkets, and rum. The Indians' usefulness to the settlers was short-lived. The settlers were good students and quickly learned how to survive in the wilderness. As the Indians became less valuable than their land and natural resources, the whites killed, enslaved, or drove them from their homeland. White power struggle fermented nationalism. England's new wealth and power gave rise to a sense of ethnic identity and nationalism amongst the settlers. This nationalism evolved from a real or imagined new cultural unity, a strong sense of we against them. The thems were other nations that England sought to subjugate, namely Indians and Africans. The, the West were, oh, sorry about that. The Wees were fellow Englishmen who colonized the Thems across the globe. To protect the Wees, 
England strengthened the maritime control over long-distance Atlantic trading routes. It enacted the Navigation Act of 1651, which in effect declared a form of economic warfare on other European nations by requiring that goods imported from any European nation or any English colony be shipped only on British vessels. The act also prohibited the colonies from either developing manufacturing industries or processing uh, or from or purchasing processed goods from any nation other than those under the control of the British crown. In addition, the Navigation Act gave England the power to establish and a monopoly in both the slave trade and marketing of slave produced products with the colonies. The English government's control of colonial trade virtually guaranteed English industries a monopoly over raw material and cash crops. This rendered the American settlers entirely dependent upon England to provide them with raw materials, consumer products, slaves, and military protection. England's monopoly so restricted so uh, so restricted and taxed the colonists that they grew belligerent and eventually became thems rather than we's and revolted in order to win their independence. Oh, let me fix that. Here we go. Next section: racism and the appetite for more wealth. Wealth created by wealth created by slaves in the New World stimulated cultural changes within Europe. For example, when Europe began to prosper from the wealth exploited through its colonial settlements, wealthy merchants and aristocratic and aristocrats were created. Their leisure lifestyle and consumer demands prompted a new cultural movement. The aristo arist 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 uh, damn, I'm jacking that up. Aristocracy, aristocracy and the middle class discuss new philosophies of religion, science, politics, and business. The neocultural values justify imperialism, capitalism, and racism. Europeans espouse the beliefs that they were a superior race that had mission to civilize so-called inferior races. This ethnocentric views was sustained by a broad sense of unity and community founded upon skin color. Judeo-Christian religions and espouse work ethic and a belief in the organized exercise of authority. European, uh, Europeans, theft of other people's lands was justified by their Christian piety. They believe that God had given land to all mankind to be cultivated. So, their belief in their own racial superiority supplied the foundation and justification for their seeking to colonize and exploit the world. Throughout the 1700s, European nations competed for control of territory and resources in the new world and exercised varying degree, degrees of harshness towards local inhabitants. As European settlers established colonial government to supervise the displacement of wealth from the oppressed countries to the motherland countries of, in Europe. The welfare of the, the exploited was of secondary importance. The calculating cruelty of colonialization in Sir William Blackstone's statement that the king can do no wrong was a necessary and fundamental practice of the English constitution. This political phrase clearly indicated the way Europeans felt about their role in exploiting slaves and Indians in new lands. The English also bestressed their religious justification for colonization with a legal system based on the concept of individual and private property rights. In response to criticism of English colonization, an unknown Englishman wrote in 1622 that it is lawful to take a land from which none youth use it and make it use and make use of it. 
The Englishman undoubtedly was referring to an old English legal concept, the right of discovery, which was in part based upon European legal doctrine, racial arrogance, and military superiority. It gave white European colonists the right to practice finders keepers with any land or resources that they discovered. With the cultural and legal backing of the right of discovery, European whites believed that they had a license to steal. In his book, A People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn expanded on the way white settlers felt about their claims to the right of discovery. Zen wrote, man, these motherfuckers are crazy. <laughs> so Zen wrote, quote, the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, created the excuse to take Indian land by declaring the area legally a vacuum. The, the Indians had not subdued the land and therefore it had only a natural right to it, but not a civil right. A natural right did not have legal standing. End of the quote. Native American culture had not generally prepared Indians to protect themselves from a land expropriating practice of the white settlers. White society, legal concepts of private ownership and of property and resources was an unfamiliar concept to Indians who, like African blacks, were communal shared rights and responsibility for the land and its resources was the basis of their culture and survival. Conflict between Europeans and Indian culture were resolved at the expense of scores of Indians. When the first white settlers arrived in the 1500s, about 2 million Indians possessed about 2 billion acres that is now the continental United States. Today, about 800,000 Indians reside on some 200 reservations, a land mass of about 2% of the original amount of land they possessed when the pilgrims arrived in 1607. Moreover, the land that were set aside as reservations for American Indians were some of the worst, some of the worst lands in the nation for sustaining agricultural products, livestock, and human life. Due to white society's oversight and later discoveries of precious metals and resources, these reservations occasionally did produce wealth. Next section, stolen land, the second greatest wealth producer. Land ownership was second only to land, uh, to only to slave labor as a source of white wealth and power in America. Without the approval of Indians, the London Company, an officially chartered immigration agency, sought to lure immigrants to America by sub substituting land grants of 100 acres to each colonial settler in lieu of the potential gold dividend. Other English chartering companies and colonial assemblies followed suit by offering land grants to newly arriving immigrants. The practice of awarding land to the head of each established household was effectively used to entice European immigrants to America. Sounds like that homestead crap. Yep. Since these lands awards represented windfall wealth that ensure economic opportunity and provided them with the basic tools for earning a living. It also generated a sense of togetherness among European immigrants in a new land. The typical colonial family only needed two acres of land per capita to produce sufficient food to survive, says Stanley Liebergott in his book, The Americans and Economic Record. Liebergott further stated that the greed of the European immigrant changed the use of Indian land from limited substance to widespread cash crop farming from religious inspiration to land speculations for capital gains. The land grants to assist colonial settlers served as one of the earliest forms of affirmative action in America. The grants gave immigrants a basic level of wealth, which they could leverage to purchase 
additional acreage, acreage, household, farming equipment, or bring black labor onto the land. This white, this whites only affirmative action program allowed three fourths of America's colonial families to own their own farms. Land grants alone were not the only government back benefit given to white settlers. After all, a new nation of aristocrats and privileged class could not be built simply on the basis of land without an available pool of labor. L land had little value. It had to be cleared and brought to production. To achieve a maximum return from the land, the white settlers needed two things, cash crops and goods for European and local markets, as well as a well-disciplined, available, non-compensated -comp and permanent labor supply. The free white labor force would not satisfy these criteria because it was scarce and expensive. Few European immigrants were willing to till soil for another when free or cheap labor was available to any white who wanted to homestead. If European serfdom had taught the pilgrims anything, it had taught them that it was essential to own one's own land and strictly avoid being bound to another's land. Shortly, before the Revolutionary War, wealth had accumulated in the in the colonies and were and the settlers were some of the richest people in the world. Less than two percent of the American immigrant population had zero or negative net worth. English tariffs and economic acts that sought to redistribute the colonies wealth to the mother country triggered a backlash of independence. After the war, man, this why I celebrate the Fourth of July. Shit, <laughs> well, let me go back. <laughs> right on. <man. laughs> After the war, the new congressional government established its own devices for transferring wealth to preferential groups. Westward, a westward expansion added new wealth building opportunities through land and slave ownership. The Northwest Ordinance in 1787 opened the new territory for homesteading. The government sold the land at public auctions for $1 per acre. To ensure that the land would not end up in the wrong hands, Congress in 1790 passed the first National Nationalism Law, which specified that America would open its doors to white immigrants only. Local governments enacted anti-mobility and anti-contracting laws that forbade blacks to either own or even step foot onto land in the new territory. Thus, government land policies had double benefits for whites. It gave them an opportunity to gain land and it laid the foundation for a permanent wealth gap between them and blacks. The next section, slaves forced France to sell Louisiana territory. In 1802, just as America was on the verge of being squeezed out of the international cotton market, black slave insurrections in the Caribbean islands gave America a land windfall. Slaves successfully revolted against their French oppressors. A self-taught Haitian slave named Toussaint L'Ouverture led a slave revolt that, with the help of yellow fever, defeated a 20,000-strong French army. Without a doubt, the Haitian Revolution, uh, the Haitian Revolt, took advantage of the only time during the colonization of the New World that white slaveholders dropped their guard enough to allow slaves to break free and take control. Uh, and after, on that note, um, the anniversary of that was January 1st that just passed. So that's why usually you guys see me every January 1st. I pay respects to uh, the Haitian uh, Independence Day, which is uh, January 1st, 1804. 
So instead of celebrating New Year's, I celebrate the uh, independence of Haiti every January 1st. All right, let me continue. Napoleon sent a French military expeditionary force to recapture Haiti by the French troops were beaten, thereby forcing France to sign a peace treaty granting the slaves their freedom and Haiti its independence. The broader international white community operated from a policy that a, quote, threat to black slavery anywhere is a threat to black slavery everywhere, end quote. But neither the United States nor any other country bothered to assist France. France's defeat at the hands of the slave army destroyed Napoleon's dream of building a French settlement at the mouth of the Mississippi River at the current site of the city of New Orleans and set the stage for the United States to purchase the Louisiana Territory for a mere $15 million, less than five cents per acre. The purchase of the Louisiana Territory, which extended from Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, doubled the size of the United States. Ironically, the Haitian Revolt provided additional land for raising cotton, which justified the expansion of black slavery. Shortly thereafter, old planters and new immigrants joined the land rush to acquire huge tracts of the new free land. They echoed the national slogan for pursuing wealth, quote, open more land and buy more Negroes, end quote. European whites were given ownership to the land and black slaves were given the obligation of picking the cotton for the next 150 years. Next section. Spain follows France lead and sells Florida. During the 1800s, Florida was the only part of the Southern North America that did not belong to the United States. So the United States government had made numerous offers. Spain refused to sell Florida as Spanish territory and not a part of the United States. Florida was a natural attraction for displaced Indians and runaway slaves. Escaped slaves took refuge in Florida and established geopolitical relations with the Indians. Slaves and their mulatto offspring were often given huge village positions as chiefs, interpreters, military advisors, and scouts, all of which aroused Southern white slaveholders who saw this as a lure to slaves seeking freedom. White planters and slaveholders encouraged General Andrew Jackson, who was noted for grabbing Indian land for his friends and personal ownership to use his military forces to remove from Florida the Indians and escaped slaves. General Jackson complied publicly, arguing that Florida was a sanctuary for escaped slaves and marauding Indians who presented a menace to white society. Florida, according to Jackson, was essential to the defense of the United States. In the year 1814, having established his public premise for taking military troops into the Spanish territory, Jackson intentionally triggered the first of the three Seminole Wars. Jackson also burned Indian villages, seized Spanish forts, and blew up Fort Negro on the Chattahoochee River in North Florida, killing more than 200 women and children. His military incursions into Florida created a political problem for Spain, which in the year 1819 agreed to Florida to give Florida to the United States in the year 1821. In appreciation, a grateful United States government appointed Andrew Jackson, Florida's first governor. Jackson assumed the governorship, then reverted back to his earlier practice of making money for himself and his friends by expropriating Indian land and black labor. 
He advised his friends to purchase Florida land and black slaves before the price rose. An Indian treaty was signed in the year 1819, and most of the Indians and free blacks were forced out of Florida. Jackson kept his promise to make free or cheap land available in Florida for cotton and sugar production. But some defiant Indians and black slaves dismissed the treaty and continued to fight for their land ownership rights for another 20 years. The Third Seminole War ended in the, in the 1840s when uh, Oak Sela, the Seminole chief, died in captivity and John Horse, the highest ranking black Indian leader after nearly 50 years of battles, ceased fighting without even having been defeated or captured. When finally concluded, the Seminole Wars had cost the United States government 1,500 soldiers and $20 million in military expenditures. In the year 1970, the United States Indian Claims Commission awarded more than 12 million in land reparations to the remainder of the Florida Seminole tribe. The government also offered an apology. Notably, however, the contributions made by black Floridian ancestors were left out of the history books and their offspring were left out of the apology as well as the reparations. Blacks have yet to receive any monetary reparations or historical recognition for their role in bringing Florida into the union. Blacks, cotton, and annexation of the Southwest. The United States went to war with Mexico in 1846, largely to satisfy slaveholders' interest in acquiring the fertile Texas Plains for rising cotton. Mexican authorities ran to groups of white land squatters, but were not willing to sell land to cotton planters. By, 18, by the 1830s, more than 20,000 whites had moved into the Texas territory, territory with more than 2,000 black slaves. Mexican authorities outlawed slavery, but white slaveholders evaded the law, or so it's evaded the law by freeing their slaves, then forcing them to sign lifetime contracts as indentured servants. The Mexican government responded by seeking to block any further white immigration into the territories. The 20,000 whites already in the territory responded by declaring squatters' rights on Mexican land, then publicly declaring such land to be free and independent from Mexico. Sounds like the Israelis and shit. Let me go to the next up here. Large Mexican armies attacked the American planters at the Alamo to recover Mexico's land. After the fall of the Alamo in the late 1840s, the president of the United States declared war against Mexico to justify annexing the territory for slaveholders. Stanley Lieber got the writer quoted President Tyler who said, the war with Mexico gave the United States a monopoly of the cotton plant and thus secured, oh, and thus secured to us a power of boundless extent in the affairs of the world. The monopoly was a great and important concern. It places all other nations at our feet. An embargo on cotton exportations during a single period produced in Europe a greater amount of suffering than a 50-year war. The U.S. won a brief war and Texas entered the Union as a slave state. Abolitionist William Floyd Garrison called the war an invasion, weighed solely on the despicable and horrible purpose of extending and perpetuating American slavery. On January 21st, 1846, Frederick Douglass, a former slave, wrote about the war in his Rochester newspaper, the North Star. He said, 
Mexico seems seems a doomed victim of Anglo-Saxon love of dominion of land. And in our next section, 1862 Homestead Act. The Homestead Act of 1862 represented America's last great land policy. It was enacted on the eve of the Civil War and provided that anyone living on land for five years while making some improvements could acquire a free title to 160 acres. This act remained in effect until 1900 and provided 400,000 to 600 families with homes and farms of all the public land that this act, uh, act passed into private hands, not more than 11 to 17% was settled by homesteaders. By 1900, most of the land had gone to, spec, uh, to uh, speculators who thus acquired the claim to rich Western land and timber material rights without having to bid or compete for the wealth. Blacks were unable to acquire any of this first time giveaway of land wealth. Many were, oh, many were interested, but, but Oh, shit, I'm jacking up. Many were interested, but had their lives threatened by whites and decided not to pursue the free land. Damn. The acquisition policy of the Homestead Act was that anyone who tended to land should not have to pay for it. But again, hypocrisy reigned. Not one had spent more time tending land than blacks, certainly not European immigrants. Yet, even free blacks were not allowed to participate in this famous land rush in the West. Both free and enslaved blacks were forced to delay their land ownership dreams and await the freedom that the Civil War would bring. Blacks were legally freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, but the end of their servitude did not result in receiving the compensation, compensation that was given to white independent indentured servants. At the end of their servitude, white indentured service servants typically received a small parcel of land as well as a suit of clothing, farming tools, crop seeds, livestock, and some money and some, sometimes guns. These were the minimal tools needed to earn a living and protect one's family. Emancipation set blacks free as ignorant, penniless, defenseless, landless, powerless, and non-competitive human beings. Literally five million blacks were made wards of the public, dependent on doubts, welfare, or whatever they could steal in order to survive. No attempts were made to correct these centuries of social engineering to which black slaves had exploited. They had no homes or free and our friends in either the North or the South. When they asked for a little help or a hand up, President Andrew Johnson in, six, in 1866, with Southern slaves encouragement, slapped them in their Sulin black faces by vetoing a congressional bill that would have given black slaves a mere 40 acres and a mule as compensation for 250 years of bondage. The next section, Southern slaveholders, the leisure class. Until recent times, Southerners sought to build and maintain a non-working class of aristocrats that prided itself on a lifestyle of unearned leisure that resulted from black labor. The Southerners views of blacks and work was based on their definition of work and their exploitation of natural resources. Sitting on the verandas or under the old oak trees became a way of life. It was as much a Southern reality as a Southern mystique. The South leisure degenerated into laziness. Blacks were the working class. Whites were the management class that enjoyed seasonal light work. Successful planters bragged about not having to do dirty, hard, quote unquote, nigger work. 
in accordance with the national anti-black public policy seen in chapter seven, blacks remain the working class while whites took credit for being the management or brains behind black labor. The next section, white indentured, white indentured servants, temporary labor only. The dream of living in a world with unlimited free land and economic opportunity appealed to impoverished whites still living in Europe. Many whites were willing to sell or contract their labor to white landowners for an opportunity to live and work in the new world. For the cost of transportation from Europe, many whites signed indentured servitude contracts. A typical contract lasted for seven years, but actually it rarely lasted beyond the servant's 21st birthday. Unlike slaves, white servants retained some personal rights. For example, the right to sue, testify in court, etc. At the end of their period of servitude, they received a monetary compensation and basic necessities for establishing a homestead and earning a living. Disgruntled indentured servants occasionally renegotiated their contracts in order to receive better provisions, or they simply broke the contracts by fleeing and establishing their own homestead on the frontier land that was available and free to any white person. The instability of the white servant labor force killed the indentured servant system. By the mid-1600s, it became clear that indentured white servants were not meeting their plantation owners' labor and production needs. Moreover, the landowners could not impose complete physical and psychological control over white indentured servants. Therefore, the landowners could not maximize profit. Since the landowners had abandoned using captured Indians as slaves, whites found that black slavery, which was flourishing in the Caribbean and South America, was the most viable label alternative. Furthermore, England had recognized the enormous economic potential in supplying slaves to the plantations. Though England had hoped to keep North America as an English nation, Labor demands in the North American colonies persuaded England to organize the Royal African Company in the year 1672 in order to supply and coordinate her slave trading activities in the New World. With the labor question resolved, the, expro the, expro the expropriation of Indian land to European whites had to occur as quickly as possible. Between the years 1607 and 1887, European whites acquired nearly every valuable square foot of Indian land via theft, legal discrimination, and occasional purchase and the violation of more than 371 Indian treaties. The American government's redistribution of Indian land amounted to preferential treatment or affir affirmative action for white settlers, especially when combined with the government's fa um, facilitation of black slavery. Moreover, to increase land utilization, some states like North and South Carolina granted free land to white settlers simply for owning slaves. In the year 1663, the states offered 20 acres of land to every white male who owned a black female slave. Such land awards encouraged mis, uh, miscegenation practices between white male slave owners and black female slaves. This practice also increased the slave owners' slave holdings and raised the black female to a higher more acceptable level over the black male slave. The dream of owning free freedom uh, and land 
which drew white settlers to America and liberated them from feudal, um, from feudal oppression in Europe was black people's worst nightmare. It smothered blacks dreams by shackling them into endless human exploitation. Oh, was you, you was taking that part too? Yeah. The next uh, section is black labor, the greatest source of white wealth. Before discussing more recent ways the whites have created bridges to wealth and power, it would be beneficial to take one final look at the economic impact that black slavery had and continues to have on economies in America and worldwide. A close examination of financial data reveals why whites have been so adamant about keeping blacks as a permanent underclass of laborers. The world saw blacks and their labor as sources of wealth, black gold. England was the king of slave trading nations. Not only was it the dominant slave trader, but was also the primary beneficiary of wealth produced by slaves in the Americas and Caribbean islands. As discussed earlier in chapter four, the English system was the harshest and undoubtedly the most profitable of the six major slave trading nations. For example, by the year 1795, Liverpool, England alone had more than 100 ships carrying slaves. This fleet of ships accounted for 50% of Europe's slave trade. Overall, during the 1700s, slave trading revenues expanded England's foreign trade by more than 700% and annual slave trade revenues averaged nearly $5 million, which in today's dollars would be nearly $50 billion annually. Slave trading and the related commercial activities were lucrative that these were so lucrative that these activities alone elevated England from a poor nation to the single most powerful nation in the world. That's why the dude yesterday that jumped in was talking about, uh, you know, we used to run the world and you guys would have been better off if we uh, uh, controlled you guys. Yeah, get out of here. That's right. <laughs> anyway, continuing on. By the year 1860, annual sales of slave-produced cotton generated more than $30 billion for England. Meanwhile, English textiles mills were still annually manufacturing increasing levels of cotton goods for retail slaves, um, retail sales. England's trading relationships with American slave plantations were so profitable that England viewed the prospect of an American Civil War to free black slaves as a significant threat to its national interest. England was well aware that growth in the English economy and the establishment of its industrial infrastructure was founded upon slave-produced products. In fact, in the year 1844, England announced in the Report of Foreign Nations that since the year 1808, four billion dollars of fixed capital has been invested in preparation for cotton goods that were wholly dependent upon slave labor. End quote. England was not willing to lose that large financial investment or the steady flow of wealth from black labor without a fight. In an effort to maintain the institution of slavery, that had benefited the English nation for more than two and a half centuries, England offered to intervene in American domestic affairs in order to prolong slavery. In addition, many within England's private business sector contributed financially to pro-slavery organizations in America. Wealth produced in Southern states it's contrary to popular myth, prior to the Civil War, the South was not poverty stricken, but held the greatest concentration of per capita wealth 
in the nation. Each of the nearly 5 million slaves represented not only a labor device for income, but also a commodity, a negotiable instrument. Slaves constituted a medium of monetary exchange that could be bartered or accepted as collateral when currency or other valuables were in short supply. A white person with a slave never, never lacked economic opportunity since his human capital could always be transferred into other forms of wealth if necessary. Ironically, before the invention of the cotton gym, slavery was on the decline. The value of, the, of slaves had dropped an average of 400 to 500 for a prime field slave. At this low market value, some northerner, some northern slaveholders were selling back. Oh, sorry about that. Some northern slaveholders were setting blacks free. In an attempt to cut this, more than 30,000 were freed around 1790. But within a decade, prices began to rise and track uh, cotton prices, begin to rise and track cotton prices. A half century later, on the eve of the Civil War, a prime slave was typically valued at sixteen or sixteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars. Land ownership, white's second great source of wealth, did not surpass slave ownership as a primary form of wealth accumulation until well after the Civil War. The profitability of black slaves as a wealth producing commodity was so great that anything short of a civil war would have had a little of slavery system. The seven billion capital investment in black slavery in 1860, other business investments in the North and the South and the federal uh, budget combined. The value of a black slave had a direct correlation to cotton prices from year to year. As the price of slaves went up or down, so did the price of cotton. Slaves' value dictated the market value of cotton, and cotton set the value of slaves. This direct relationship existed from the latter part of the 17th century to the mid-18th century. Furthermore, the prices and values varied very little from region to region within the country. Slaves were walking credit cards. Any white who owned a slave could always earn money by either selling the slave labor or selling the slave. Both the slave and his labor carry value. Consequently, non-slave owners were decidedly poorer than those who owned slaves. And since nearly all black slaves were in the South, the nation's wealth was in the South, according to Robert W. Fogel in his book, Without Consent of Contract in 1860, two out of three males with a, with a $100,000 personal net worth live in the South and own slaves. The relation of typical cotton uh, belt farms was four times greater than that of usual Northern farmers and was 91 times greater than that of the typical urban common labor. A comparison of northern and southern farms indicates that wealth was disproportionately skewed to the south. On average, the large southern plantation owner who used, his, who used slave gang systems had 18 times more wealth than a northern farmer and nearly 400 times more wealth than the average northern urban farmer. Robert W. Fogo claimed that a poor southerner who owned nothing more than two had access comparable to the average northerner with all of his personal property, livestock, modest savings, and real estate. White wealth created through slavery benefited not only the actual plantation owner, but also numerous businesses in the community. Many uh, Southern entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs acquire wealth by providing support uh, services and goods to slaveholders. Some Southern businesses could survive by providing services and goods ranging from household 
effects and farm tools to the leather slave restraints sold exclusively to plantations. This demand was significant enough that nearly 20% of the manufacturing firms that service slaves plantations were located in South prior to the Civil War. Farms and small town businesses sustained themselves by buying and selling slaves produced products. Businesses supporting plantations generated massive amounts of capital, which was calculated throughout the communities, which was sorry about the which was circulated throughout the communities. The multiplying effect helped establish and sustain southern seaport towns like Charleston, Savannah, Norfolk, and Louisiana, New Orleans. After the slaves were emancipated, those who had founded their livelihood in exploiting free black labor feared the potential financial consequences. Farmers, former plantation owners, merchants, bankers, ship, shippers, clerks, and in fact, the entire Southern community had a vested financial interest in maintaining a large and cheap supply of labor. Reconstruction failed to provide the former slaves with any measurable economic start. The denial of 40 acres and a mule ensured that these former slaves would never comprise a part of the American ownership class. Moreover, the larger white communities restricted blacks from producing and marketing products that competed with white businessmen or farmers. Cultural customs and laws forced the newly emancipated Blacks to conform to the historical image of Blacks and as common labor. Sorry about that. Although Blacks were skilled and well experienced agricultural planters and livestock breeders, they had no farm tools, livestock money, or land upon which to earn a living. And the community had no intentions of allowing black labor to escape their control. Most blacks in desperation were compelled by white hostilities to return to the plantation, either, at, either for pitiful wages or as sharecroppers, where they were soon bound to the master's land almost as firmly as they had been in bondage, said historian Norman Hodges. Next section. The northern states also thrived off black labor. As in the south, the northern states also thrived off the labor of black people through profits from businesses connected to slavery industry. As contrary to popular belief, most northerns were not opposed to black slavery. A few abolitionists opposed slavery on moral grounds, but the greater preponderance of northerners directly, not indirectly, supported slavery by enjoying the fruits of it, by eating the foods, wearing the clothes, and drinking the rum that black labor produced. New England, the home of the Quakers and anti-slavery forces, had three times as many textile mills as the entire South. These, manuf these mills manufacturers processed, retailed, and generally thrived off of slavery produced cotton. The first cotton mills in the United States was built at Beverly, Massachusetts around 1808. By 1817, slaves were annually producing more than 126 million pounds of cotton that had a value of approximately 15 million for processing in northern textile mills alone. Numerous uh, historians, including Stanley Liebergott, Ian Elliott, and Robert Fogau, documented the high productivity of slaves and products and wealth they produced for Northerners as well, well as Southerners. By 1850, more than 1,000 cotton factories operated in the United States. Northern mills pr processed one quarter of all slave produced cotton. The cotton provided clothes, fabrics, jobs, income, wealth, taxes, and other benefits to populations to the North. So while Northern anti slavery for 
was a pause on one second. All right, there we go. Yeah, I see my stream was uh, breaking up a little bit. So here we go. So it was a, let me catch back up. And the Northern Textile Mills use long, uh, hold on, let me catch back up where I was at as I lost track. All right, the cotton produced clothes, fabrics, income, wealth, taxes, and other benefits to populations throughout the North. So while Northern anti-slavery forces opposed slavery on moral grounds, it was apparent from the kinds of businesses that were supporting Northern economies that every Northern uh, Northerner benefit from slavery. Black slaves produced raw products for the markets and in turn were market, uh, or in turn were a market for the finished products. The textile and leather industries tailored a major portion of the consumer items towards a captured market. The slavery institution, New England textile mills, used long strand cotton to make fine fabrics for whites, while the short strand cotton was used to produce cheapest and coarsest clothes for blacks. The clothes referred to as black cloth or nigger cloth was the lower grade material that the textile industries to produce clothing for 5 million slaves and free blacks. The shoe industry was equally discriminating in its quality. Like the textile industry, the Northeast shoe industry produced two different grades of footwear for the South. It produced fine shoes for the white market, which were carefully crafted, expensive leather boots, the manufacturing outlets also designed cheap, rough footwear, such as sandals and brogans for black slaves and free blacks with marginal income. Jugglers, there is little doubt that the textile and bootery industries were extremely profitable businesses during slavery. So much so that a few of the original companies were still in existence a hundred years after slavery ended. The high economic value of exploiting black labor would not let slavery die a timely death. Many slave, Southern slaveholders cautioned Northern abolitionists and businessmen not to hurt their own business opportunities by advocating for freedom of blacks, for freedom for blacks. For example, in 1787, John Rutledge, a South Carolina South Carolina argued that freedom or that it was counterproductive for a southerner, for northerner states to oppose slavery because they would benefit by transporting products of slave labor. And in subsequent years, as Rutledge predicted, northern shipbuilders amassed fortunes building commercial vessels that haul slaves and durable goods to the Caribbean islands, Europe, and other ports around the world. Nearly a third of England's well-known well maritime fleets was constructed by these northern builders, but the industry's benefits did not end there. Major insurance and bonding companies could develop around the shipping industry. They assured policies that covered slave produced goods from most major ports. At the behest of industrialists and shipbuilders, northerner states invested in the construction of water canals and railroads to speed slave produced products across the nation. Though the, though the North pretended, op, pretended opposition to the roots of slavery, the North drew its very existence from the South and its peculiar institutions. The financial benefits of slavery effectively muted the voices of most Northerners. While forced to make a choice between making wealth and making policies to free 5 million lowly, lowly Black slaves, whites in the North, like South, place a greater value on accumulating wealth and power. Of those who sympathize with black slaves, 
probably few, few associated the price of black suffering with the quality of life that whites were privileged to lead as free citizens. Abolitionists and other anti-slavery groups did not relate to slave products to the production of wealth, consumer products, and life's comfort. Elliot, a writer and lawyer, in his pre-Civil War writing summed up the moral issues and the ineffectiveness of religious organizations in abolishing slavery. In 1853, he wrote that religious anti-slavery forces were ineffective because nine-tenths of the cotton uh, consumed in the Christian world was produced by black slaves. He charged that all, all enjoyed all the were co-conspirators. Without black labor, without black labor, there would have been few products to market or tax for government. Black people in their labor was first and foremost an economic issue, not a moral issue. This is just as true in the 20th century as it was in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. In all probability, had the anti-slavery forces made ending slavery an economic issue in need of an immediate conclusion instead of a moral issue that would change as man's hearts changed, slavery would not have lasted for 250 years. As an economic issue, the abolitionists could have directly in, embargoed or boycotted products produced by slave labor, just as the colonists had boycotted products from England in order to get their freedom during the Revolutionary War. Next section. Creative slavery profiteers. During the off season, or when a slave owner had more labor force than work, he would rent out slave crews on a quote unquote mobile basis to surrounding farms. <clears throat> According to several historians, it was quite a common sight to see large slave gangs moving on the roads early in the morning or late in the evenings between plantations and, or, or farms. These slave gangs were often rented to other planters or to local factory operators. Fair-minded slaveholders would even allow slaves to contact to contract out their services in day labor and retain a portion of their own earnings. The, the few slaves fortunate enough to have several masters were often able to save enough to eventually purchase their own freedom. Other smaller businessmen earn sizable incomes by auctioning or breeding black slaves. Auctioneers establish offices in major slave entry points and seaport towns such as Charlestown, Norfolk, and Baltimore. The typical auction fee was a commission of two and a half percent of the total sale cost of each slave. If we assume that each of the five million slaves was sold at least once, then a two and a half percent auctioneer's commission paid on the average price per slave of $1,000 uh, would have produced a billion dollar industry. After the United States banned slave trading in the year 1808, the top prices of prime slaves gradually rose as high as $1,800. Slave traders and investors sought alternative ways of meeting the nation's growing demand for slaves. Between the years 1810 and 1864, a larger commercially profit, profitable domestic slave trading industry was established between the old slave states and the newer states entering the Union. Slave breeding emerged as a profitable industry. In the year 1810, a full one-third of the profits of plantation owners in the old regions of the South resulted from breeding slaves for sale in the interstate slave trade. Like dogs, man, that's crazy. White males 
use their power to manipulate the sexuality of black males for economic gain. Hmm. They use them to breed with their own slaves or lease them out for stud service. Most large plantations had a stable of black slaves to perform stud services, which brought in money from neighboring farms. Every newborn black baby represented hundreds of dollars in capital gain to the slaveholder. Black studs, like prize bulls, brought the top dollar in slave trading. Similarly, black females were advertised and sold for their reproductive potential, especially teenage females. Even older black females had higher value if they had successfully given birth to a child. According to one commentator, quote, a fair price for a healthy 30-year-old Negro woman with a child was a quarter more than that of a non-breeding woman, end quote. The next section, Blacks and Indians denied access to gold. In a financial sense, Black slaves had the Midas touch. This labor in Virginia's tobacco fields created the first gold rush. Their labor in cotton created the second gold rush in the fields of the East and Midwest. As a result of the war with Mexico over Texas and slavery, California was acquired from Mexico through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Almost immediately afterward, in the year 1849, a natural resource, gold, was discovered in California. This discovery of gold ignited a massive influx of wealth seekers from around the world. Within four years of the big discovery, more than $200 million worth of gold had reportedly been extracted. National race-based economic preferences and immigration policies emerged and were adopted in the California gold fields. The two groups who had contributed the most towards the building of the new nation, Indians with their land and Blacks with their labor, were systematically excluded from participating in the gold rush. In an effort to keep California gold rush a quote-unquote white-only treasure hunt, public pronouncements made it clear to free Blacks and Indians that if they wanted to pan gold, they could only do it as a slave to a white person. The hundreds of free blacks who traveled to California in search of gold, not re-enslavement, were blocked by local laws and white vigilante violence. California was one of the few free states, so blacks forced out of the gold fields had few other places to go. Most starved to death were lynched or died from exposure. The few who survived were forced to, quote unquote, inhabit the worst parts of the town and lived commonly in filth and degradation. Like blacks, Indians fared badly. In the year 1845, four years before the gold rush started, approximately 1,000, uh, excuse me, approximately 150,000 Indians lived in California. After the gold rush ended, barely 35,000 Indians remained. The intentional exclusion of blacks and Indians from acquiring wealth or a part of the quote-unquote American dream had been established into national policy in the year 1836 by Secretary of War Lewis Cass, who rationalized, quote, we are living, we are all striving in the career of life to acquire riches of honor, power, or some other object whose possession is to realize the daydreams of our imaginations and the aggregate of these efforts constitute the advance of society, but there is little of this in the constitution of our savages, end quote. But not all non-white groups experience such systematic and exclusionary treatment. As word of the gold rush spread, large waves of Southern European 
Chinese, and Mexican immigrants sought their fortunes in California. Whites considered Chinese more acceptable than Indians or Blacks. Accordingly, state and federal government officials praised them as hardworking and thrifty. The Chinese were accepted into the ranks of the gold seekers. Some state claims and even found a little gold. Others worked in mining camps doing odd jobs. But most Chinese failed to find gold and had little choice but to open ethnic businesses or offer their labor at low wages. Similarly, Mexicans had greater access to the gold fields that either blacks or, uh, than, than either blacks or Indians. The greater acceptance of Mexicans could have resulted from the Spanish culture that was prominent in California, or from the fact that Mexicans had not been categorically and historically abused by white society. Although Mexicans ranked lower than Chinese and preferred skin color. In the early 1850s, the total number of Mexicans was less than 3,000 in the entire nation. Therefore, they did not present either a challenge or a threat to whites, as did the more than 5 million blacks. Though Chinese and Mexicans were non-white, they supported European whites' practice of excluding blacks and Indians from pers uh, prospecting for gold. A minister for this period reportedly observed that, quote, the immigrants became the bitterest of Negro haters within 15 days of their naturalization as American citizens, end quote. Apparently, learning to despise blacks was an important aspect in the acculturation of immigrants. Blacks carried a heavy burden. They were the, they were the target of everyone's hostilities but were totally unable to defend themselves or compete. Neither Chinese nor Mexicans endured the kind of discriminations that Blacks did. Only Blacks were the systematic victims of cultural customs and laws that denied them legal freedom, the fruits of their labor, the right of property ownership, the right to protect their person, family, and race, and a promising future. Many social scientists and politicians justified the near total exclusion of free blacks from any land ownership and wealth building activity on the basis that the United States Constitution declared them non citizens and subhuman. But such reasoning does not hold, especially since there was a constant influx of non English European, Hispanic, and Asian immigrants who were neither citizens nor white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. If free blacks were ineligible to own land, why did the government encourage them to participate in every military conflict with a promise of land and other veterans' benefits at war's end? The next section. Black vets deny access to preferential wealth. Many years later, the American government played another role in preferential wealth distributed to whites. The government passed wealth to its white veterans, both the living and the dead. Through the years, America has expressed its gratitude to its war veterans in a variety of ways, primarily through land grants, land bounties, and homesteading opportunities. In the year 1642, the same year that Massachusetts introduced slavery into the colonies, Virginia enacted a law forcing Blacks to join a militia and protect the larger white society. In the year 1763, Virginia became one of the first of the colonies to set aside a large section of territory west of the uh, Alleghenies as bounties for veterans. Later in the 19th century, a veterans land program was established by the federal government to recognize and reward servicemen who had served in wars from the revolutionary through the Spanish-American War with Mexico. Blacks have participated to varying degrees in nearly every war in which this country has engaged 
since the year 1619. Yet Blacks have received little monetary compensation for any form of their military service to this nation. The Veterans Land Program offered veterans either a homestead site or six feet for a burial site. Since Blacks were the only non-English racial or ethnic group that had fought in every major military involvement since the initial settlement in 1619, they were optimistic that perhaps they would be included in the Veterans Land Program. However, Black veterans did not qualify for the homesteading site. Until the 1960s, Black veterans fortunate enough to be eligible for a free six-foot burial site were discriminated against even in death. Preferential treatment at most cemeteries and gravesites enforced a quote-unquote whites-only rule. Affirmative action for special interest groups after the Civil War, when nearly all of the land and wealth building resources have been claimed by members of the majority white society. Conservative uh, social forces began campaigns against any governmental program or policies that pre portended assistance or redistribution of wealth to blacks. Convinced that the majority white society was well in possession or control of wealth, power, and resources, conservatives promoted an ideology that the right people were already aboard the wealth boat. So keep the gang plank up. In 1860, 5% of the population controlled approximately 25% of the country's wealth. 130 years later, after, the, after a civil war, two war wars, a major economic depression, and the civil rights movement, the major possessors of wealth remain unchanged. 5% of the American population still controls 25% of the country's total wealth. Most of this wealth was passed on from generation to generation. The younger generation of whites resent being held morally or financially responsible for the racial sins of their ancestors. Though, as whites, they still enjoy the inherited advantages and privileges of slavery. Ironically, most wealth, wealthy conservatives today pretend that they earned their wealth rather than admit they got it the old fashioned way through preferential government treatment, exploitation of black weight, uh, labor, expropriations of Indian land, or simply as an inheritance from those who acquired it through one or another combination of those three ways. Conservative elements oppose re re reparations or any government program that benefits blacks, but few acknowledge the existence of or oppose systematic government programs that distribute wealth to various special interest groups within the majority white society. Despite current political rhetoric, blacks are not the primary recipients of federal grants. Federal grants, aka giveaways, are subsidies. Historically, the largest recipients of federal government, largest have been railroad, ranchers, farmers, and miners. Theoretically, Public lands and resources within the United States are owned by or held in trust for all citizens. Accordingly, the federal government should manage properties in a way that benefits all Americans. However, the government has not managed public properties in, in, in an even-handed manner in the best interest of all people. The federal government has systematically permitted a select wealthy population to use, exploit, and profit from those lands, from those, sorry about that, profit from these programs frequently never required the recipients to pay anything. And when payment is required, the payment never approached the fair market values for the public resource. As such, these programs amount to massive taxpayers funding subsidies to the recipients. 
Due to the racial policies and feelings within the, within the nation at the time these grants were made, the benefits were doled out along racial lines. These programs, some of you to this day can therefore be raised government preferences for whites even now. But somehow Americans have never allowed themselves to think this way. The term preferential treatment only applies when federal programs are targeted that to provide assistance to disfavored groups. Meanwhile, preferential government assistance that benefits the majority group are, simp are simply seen as either maintaining the status quo or as temporary assistance to a vital segment of the population in the interest of national security. Majority preferences, uh, majority preference programs are pervasive and so accepted that it is almost a radical notion to, uh, to term it white affirmative action. Yet if we apply the definition equally, this is clearly what these programs are. The following sections, this following section discusses some affirmative program for whites. Like I say, a lot of the wealth people in this country sustain wealth from being welfare recipients. The next section, the railroad company, king of special interest. And let me get up this one clip. Give me one second. All right. The railroad companies, the king of special interest. The major purpose of building the railroad system across the America, across America was to move slave produced goods to domestic markets and to seaports for shipping to foreign markets. Centuries of sales of slave produced cotton, tobacco, rice, and indigo had the southern economy and stained the northern businesses upon which the American domestic and foreign trades were based. In the use of Black in America, historian Dan Lacey discuss how black labor subsidized the development and westward expansion of the railroads. According to Lacey, according to Lacey, the shiploads of cotton poured onto the docks of Liverpool, England, financed the factories and railroads of the United States in the vast settlements of the American West. In the economic life of, the, of 19th century America, with black labor, cotton was king and cause nations to prosper and expand. To facilitate the shipment and sales of these goods and to support the cotton economy, government did everything possible to persuade the railroads and their stockholders to build lines across the country. Just between the years of 1850 and 1871, Congress gave railroad sections of land extending six miles on each side of the railroad tracks, the nation to, to, on each side of the railroad tracks across the nation, and totaling more land area than the entire state of Texas. Politicians argue that if the railroads were persuaded with free land to build their lines across the country, then farmers and merchants would soon follow, and the general populace would be closed behind. This great land giveaway to the wealthy white elite was done in the name of building America. Railroad builders exploited their process with the government by upgrading their free land for better land. For example, before the 1900s, Con Con enacted law that permitted, the rail permitted a railroad to exchange property it owned on an Indian reservation for federal land outside the reservation. Under this provision, for instance, Railroads exchange millions of acres of worthless or low value land for land located on the fertile valleys of Washington, Oregon, and Montana. These exchanges had nothing to do with building railroad, the railroad lines. The railroad lines such as Illinois Central were allowed to purchase additional millions of acres from the government at a price of five cents an acre to build additional tracks. These same railroads later made massive fortunes by reselling the land that they received free from the government to land speculators 
Arthur Howard Zinn indicated the potential profit state of uh, the profit stating in this quote, within 10 years, the Illinois Railroad Line publicly announced that it had 1 million 100,000 acres, or less than one and a half of its original grant for sales in 40 or uh, 40 acre lots and upwards at prices ranging from five to $25 per acre, whereas the national domain was offered at 1.5 per, uh, per acre. And that's the end of the quote. Of approximately 2,600,000 acres that the Illinois Central Rail Line received from the government through land grants, all but 450,000 acres were sold in less than 20 years. Whites holding corporate stocks and bonds in these railroads also received significant capital gains through millions of acres of the best public lands was first given to their companies free of charge. They were then allowed to reap a second windfall capital gain by upgrading the land for better public, uh, for better public land. Blacks, on the other hand, could not profit from the railroad land grants because they were slaves or poor free men who could not or who could not hold or purchase any of the land, railroad stocks, bonds, or hold corporate positions. The common perception of blacks as slaves made it nearly impossible for a black to get a paying job with a railroad line. Many railroad lines actually purchased slaves as property and business equipment. Railroads used slaves to do the heavy loading maintain tracks and railroad cars. Other times, slaves were purchased on speculation for capital gains. According to Stanley Lieberger, the North Carolina Railroad listed among its assets, real estate tools and two Negroes worth $1,550. Even when railroads held public auctions or sold their land holdings, few, if any, Blacks could afford to purchase any of the parcels. As a result, there were no free Black shareholders or heirs to the railroad fortunes. Beyond being able to own railroad stocks, they could not get railroad service in their communities. The railroads would not establish train stations in Black sections of any town or city, nor hire uh, Blacks for or anything except the most low paying jobs. The next section, ranchers and grazers. Ranchers have also been a long time beneficiary of federal funds. Much of the land in the Western states was a red and profitable only for grazing livestock, but the small size of many of the holdings made ranching difficult. Beginning in the 1850s, corporations and individuals sought to acquire large tracts of land in the Louisiana Territory and westward to use the public natural resources for grazing. The large open tracts of federal land represented extremely valuable property. Many ranchers boldly grazed their livestock on these federal lands without permission or payment and the federal government allowed it. As a result, the public range quickly became severely overgrazed. To prevent further overgrazing, Congress passed the Taylor Grazing Act in the year 1934. But the, but the legislation only provided additional federal subsidies and benefits to the ranchers. For example, it provided preferential permits low grazing fees, and federal funding for range improvements such as fencing and revegetation. As a result, taxpayers provided further subsidies to the ranchers. They now pay the bill for fencing off and replanting these federal lands so that ranchers could get continued or so, so that ranchers could continue to use them. The ranchers never pay fair market value for the use of these government lands and allow their greed to place personal gains over 
per, uh, preserving the public's interest in these properties. The Bureau of Land Management, which supervises more than 500 million acres of federal lands, estimated in the 1970s that approximately 80% of the land in the far west that had been leased to ranchers had been overgrazed and damaged. The federally granted grazing rights gave the ranchers additional financial benefits beyond providing a financial windfall in free livestock feed. Ranchers holding federally issued grazing permits can use them to appreciate the value of their personal private farming and ranching properties. For example, if a rancher holds 20,000 acres under his name and leases another 150,000 acres from the Bureau of Land Management, he can sell his 20,000 acres at a price that includes the value of the use of the other 150,000 acres of public land. This additional value can be passed from one generation to the next as a form of wealth. In addition, ranchers can use grazing permits as security for loans from local financial institutions. Ironically, these lending practices enhance the political power of the ranchers since lending institutions had a financial incentive to oppose political proposals that would increase the cost of availability of federal grazing rights and thereby reduce the profitability of these ranchers. The political strength of the groups back in this federally sponsored handout was evident in recent short-lived attempts to reform grazing rights. Though Blacks are cited as the primary recipient of taxpayer-funded, quote-unquote, freebies, Blacks have been systematically denied participation in the establishment of this grazing subsidy system, and therefore are still barred from participating in any of the subsequent benefits that still occur to current ranchers. Next section, farmers. Farmers were also a major beneficiary of federal aid programs. Over the last century, various laws allowed agrarian homesteaders to claim millions of acres of public lands for farming. For example, the Homestead Act of 1862 gave 160 acres to any settler who would farm the land for five years. Nearly all of the earlier large farms were originally acquired through direct or indirect government homesteading assistance. These properties often remain in the family for generations, and their value was frequently augmented by additional government subsidies and tax advantages. This preferential treatment still exists. When Ronald Reagan became president, the Federal Price Support Program had an annual budget of $4 billion per year. He increased the annual budget to a record $57 billion. From the year 1986 to 1989, Reagan spent on average $600,000 per farm. This massive redistribution of public funds amounts to an expensive affirmation action program for rural white Americans. Clearly, government-sponsored farm support programs have provided a steady source of income and a safety net for generations of farmers. Congress decided in the year 1967 that farmers could sell or rent their quota to other landowners. Once a quota is separated from the land, it becomes a commodity all its own, just like silver or gold. Production quotas are sold at public auctions and advertised for rent in newspapers. It is ironic, but the, con the country is adamantly opposed to the use of quotas to help blacks, but feels no such reluctance in establishing beneficial quotas on peanuts, for example. 
government has provided subsidies to non-black special interest groups for more than two centuries. Some of the federal government's favorite annual subsidies and special interests are a $188 million subsidy for fertilizer research with the Tennessee Valley Authority, a $32 million 40-year-old subsidy to honey producers, a $212 million 42-year-old subsidy to wool and uh, mohair farmers, and the $470 million annual subsidy to farmers. Besides import commodity quotas, farmers profit from corn, wheat, tobacco, soybean, and peanut allotments and quotas. For example, in 1949, the United States Department of Agriculture established a minimum support price for peanuts that the government pays if the market does not. Under this income maintenance system, only farms with a peanut quota or allotment can produce peanuts for sale in the United States and only a specific number of pounds. Mining, similarly for nearly a century and a half, the federal government conducted a program that conferred federal subsidies and grants almost exclusively to white miners. Beginning in the mid 1800s, both individuals and major corporate conglomerates were allowed to exploit thousands of acres of public land for their own private benefit. Though the federal government held these lands in trust for all American citizens, the Mining Act, the Mining Act, the Mineral Act of, of 1866 and the General Mining Law of 1872 in effect allow a redistribution of land and mineral resources from the public trust to a select group of individuals and businesses. The General Mining Law of 1972 opened all unreserved public lands to mineral exploration and extraction, allowing those who actually found minerals to stake a claim without, notifi without notifying or obtaining permission from the Federal Land Management Agency, exclude other uh, prospectors and use that uh, natural resources are available on the claim for necessary mining needs. Commentators observe that after several years of eligible work and payment of a modest fee, a locator could be granted a federal patent that entitled him or her the outright ownership of the uh, former mining claim. Once a claim has been, plant, been patented, the, the owner can do whatever he or she wants with the claim using it selling it for mining purposes at no time was the local uh was the local uh, locator uh patentee required to pay rent or a royalty to the united states as a result private mining companies gouged and scared and, and scared the public lands in search of in search of uh, coal iron ore aluminum gold and silver such policies are not a thing of the past in fact some are still active. The Washington Post reported that Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt finally stripped the Bureau of Land Management of authority to confer low-cost mining rights of federal on federal lands in 1993. He found it offensive that politically connected miners could acquire federal lands for as little as 250, I mean $2.50 per acre upon demonstrating that the land contained valuable minerals. Surprisingly, even foreign firms have been allowed to use U.S. laws to get preferential mining rights and mineral rights in, Ameri in American mines while paying little, if anything, for them. For, exact, for example, a Canadian firm, the American Bar Research Corp, controls the largest gold mine in America. Located in Nevada, the mine has gold deposits and reserves valued at $8 billion. The United States 
government wants to sell the mine land to Canada for $2.50 per acre and charge no royalties on gold ex on extracted gold. But federal courts has ordered the Clinton administration to sell oh, to sell to the uh, Barrick, Barrick company for as little as $5 per acre. Barrick gets 1,949 acres worth billions of dollars. In the very same article, Representative George Miller of California, chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee and a leading advocate for junking the 19, for the 1872 law, react, re, what is that? reacted to uh, the cell in a way that could easily be a summary of Black America's feelings. He said, the lesson is the law should have been changed a long time ago. It is absolutely unfair to the American people that you would continue to process to uh, process that takes land that is owned by by them for their benefit and are simply give them away to, for private profit without the American people sharing in any of it. It is very sad and sorry state of affairs, though foreign firms like Barrett have been allowed to own and exploit the, the nation's land and natural resources, Blacks have been systematically denied the opportunity. As far back as 1856, the United States Attorney General, Caleb Cushing, ruled that free Blacks did not have the right to apply for or enjoy the benefits under the Land Preemption Act of 1841. Until emancipation, black slave labor was the primary tool in mining operations. Mining companies often owned and maintained their own slaves, but more frequently, they simply leased slaves from local owners for as little as $120 or $200 per year. Black slaves were the first and most preferred mine workers. Mining dangers and harsh labor requirements significantly shorten Blacks already short life expectancy. As the quality of mining conditions and salaries improve, Blacks were replaced with European immigrants. Man, the Heritage Foundation, an ultra-conservative right-wing group, continues to rationalize and promote the redistribution of public lands and natural resources to wealthy elites as necessary for the public good and national interest. In its mandate for leadership, three policy strategies for the 1990s, which serve as a Bible for the Reagan and Bush administrations, the foundation suggested that the Republican administration should instruct the Department of Interior's Bureau of Land Management and Mineral Management Services to provide private business with increased access to mineral deposits on public lands in oils and gas leases in the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve, slack and due diligence requirements and permit the marketplace to decide the value of these land leases. The, let me get the image up real quick. The Heritage Foundation did not attempt to hide its support for the centuries old partnership between businesses, between business and government, under which business provides campaign support for politicians. And in turn, politicians provide subsidies and tax loopholes for businesses. This partnership ensures that the white power elites will continue to receive wealth from the public's loss. Conservatives argue that giving public money, natural resources, and other financial benefits to certain wealthy individuals and businesses in private sector stimul in the private sector stimulates further investments within the economy. The benefit of this activity eventually trickled down to the less fortunate, thereby benefiting all Americans. Conservatives argue that federal grants to the less fortunate Americans are bad economic are bad economic are bad economics because poor people do not reinvest the benefits of these federal grants do not therefore 
trickle up throughout the economy. Under this hypercritical reasoning, only the overwhelmingly white wealthy can and should be beneficiaries of federal aid programs. Next section, corporate and other special interests. In the 1980s, while poor blacks were denied educational and business opportunities, bank loans, home mortgages, food stamps, welfare payments, and other forms of assistance, the federal government, headed by conservative politicians, administered a system of financial incentives, sorry, incentives, cash payments, loans, and favorable repayment terms, tax breaks, lucrative government contracts, and other giveaway giveaways for wealthy individuals and corporations. These policies combined with business like friendly legislation, such as refusal to raise minimum wage, amounted to an affirmative action program for wealthy corporations, common cause compiled data on governmental preferential treatment policies for these wealthy producing industries. And that's why I don't fuck with Trump, <laughs> but go ahead. Right. In conclusion, blacks were involved in every aspect of the development of the American nation. We cleared the land and produced the crops. We raised the food and the children of white families. We fought in every war and developed the land expropriated from the American Indians, though we were permitted to be buried only in certain non-white areas of this very land. Blacks produced the wealth what whites in both the old and new worlds possessed and claimed to have achieved by the sweat of their brows. The centuries of physical and psychological abuse that black people suffered were tragic. But even worse, the dominant white society has systematically hidden the fact that the foundations of the American, European, Latin American, and Caribbean economies are rooted in the labor and production of blacks. Black labor fueled the exponential growth in the economies of numerous nations around the world. For centuries, slave produce products were found in every home in every Christian and non-Christian nation. Slaves produced the raw goods that filled storage facilities, warehouses, and merchant shelves in nearly two thirds of the world. They provided fibers for textiles and clothes, food, alcohol, and raw materials for the factories. Black slaves and Jim Crow labor directly or indirectly generated not only thousands of jobs in vertically integrated industries, but also provided what most people of this nation wore and ate. The increased reliance on computers and immigrant law labor has all but ended white society's dependence on black muscle power. Yet, the planned obsolescence of black labor will only exacerbate 600 year black holocaust second class citizenship will only end when blacks can recognize political economic and social trends and policies that are detrimental to them as a group and collectively demand either an end to such practices or inclusion as beneficiaries of such practices and that concludes Chapter six of Black Labor, White Wealth, The Search for Power and Economic Justice by author, Dr. Claude Anderson. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, man. That was a great chapter right there. I really enjoyed that, man. Thank you guys out there tuning in as well. Appreciate you guys. And uh, are you able to go on for tomorrow for chapter seven? Yes, sir. We only got uh, three more chapters left, y'all. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And uh, seven thirty is cool for you. Yeah, seven thirty works. All right. Cool. All right. Perfect. So we'll be back in here tomorrow, man. 
Yes, indeed. Any final words? Yes, sir. Just much appreciation and uh, respect. Peace and blessings to everybody that's in the chat live, that's commenting. We can tell that y'all are listening to us, and that is the best uh, feeling in the world because it uh, lets us know that we ain't just up here reading, even though we, we would be reading if there was nobody in the chat. It just, um, at least for me, it feels good to look and see that y'all are responding to what we are saying in the moment, reacting, conversating amongst each other, adding great input from yourselves with the knowledge that you have, as well as uh, also building up each other. And I love to see that positive energy, um, peace and blessings to all you who are watching this or listening to this on the replay. Please hit that like button. Please subscribe to Boxing Conversations with Reggie Owens. Please subscribe to Tank Obadiah TV. Please subscribe to the Sweet Science Examiner for your boxing talk. And come back, come back, come back. We got three more chapters left in this book. And once again, peace and blessings and salute to Dr. Claude Anderson for putting this together. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And that's all I got, folks. We'll catch you guys here tomorrow, 7.30 p.m. West Coast time, 9.30 Central, 10.30 Eastern Standard Time. We'll be right back in here to continue with the book. And we, like we said, chapter by chapter, we're getting you all the way through with this great information put together by our author, the world famous, legendary, iconic, Dr. Claude Anderson, living legend, man. So uh, that's all we got, man. We'll catch you in here tomorrow. Yes, sir. See y'all tomorrow. Peace.